Before we get into this one, I want to give a huge shout out to Soul for inspiring this video. A hero would sacrifice you to save the world, but a villain would sacrifice the world to save you. Some random dude in a YouTube comment. What makes a true hero? Is it someone who fights against evil? Is it someone who protects others? Or is it someone who is admired by others? The latter definition is most commonly used to describe a hero at least according to the dictionary. And if I was actually gonna listen to the dictionary's boring ass answer to this question, then I wouldn't be making this video in the first place. Guts and Griffith both seem like heroes in their own ways, all the while both having done preposterous things, <clears throat> one more than the other. There are a ton of protagonist and antagonist parallels that are truly masterful. But I mean, is there really any dynamic on the level of Guts and Griffith? That was a rhetorical question, we all know the answer to that right? It's crazy to me how there can be two completely different characters that also have so many similar character traits. The two metaphorically represent the idea that in good there is evil and in evil there is good. Guts, for example, despite being through literal hell through his childhood, is objectively a good person, at least as a child, because goddamn have you seen this man post a clip? While he's with the band of the hawk, there isn't really detectable malice within him. Yeah, he's had some traumatic experiences, and by some I mean a lot, but once he overcame that PTSD, he honestly became a pretty chill dude, with the exception of how he talks with Casca, but let's be honest, back then she was a little bit- Bro, you can't see oh that, that's God. offensive. What the bro, hell, bro, bro, bro apologize. apologize. But as good of a person as Guts is, the way he presents himself and the way he dresses, especially later on in the story, immediately mask him as some kind of demon. Griffith, on the other hand, is something like a god, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that. To the band of the hawk that he leads, he's pretty much a deity. Similar to Guts, the way he dresses covers up who he truly is, just in a completely different way to Guts. Griffith is presented almost always in pure white clothing, Guts in pure black. Of course, this is an obvious thing to pick up on, but it's actually kind of brilliant if you think about it. It's even in their nicknames, the White Hawk and the Black Sword. Okay, you get the point, I'll move on. Griffith, despite being a seemingly good person, is, to put it lightly, f***ing weird. And it's exactly that weird side of him that parallels him to Guts. More on that later. Post Eclipse, Griffith gains the power of the God Hand and becomes Femto. I know it's obvious, but Griffith isn't all black in this form, contrary to his previous all white look. After he sacrificed the Hawks, the darkness he had all along turned him into Femto. That's actually a lie because he turned himself into Femto, but you get the point. And it's not that Griffith does actually anything bad with this power, to be honest, he actually does the opposite of that, and he creates a literal paradise, one that has never been seen. One in which humans, monsters, elves, and literally anything else can get along together. He develops his own kingdom, defeats the Kushan who were threatening his peace, and kinda united the world. He's the angel, the god, the one who saved the world, the ruler of the great kingdom of Falconia, the one who soars above all others, the White Hawk. Just what did he do to get here? Is he truly human? Is he what you'd consider a hero? If you're talking about what Griffith ends up doing after he gains his immense power, then yes, this is the act of a hero. But what Griffith did in order to gain the ability to set this plan into motion is completely different. That was not the act of a hero, nor a villain. Griffith did a villainous act in order to become a hero. Does this make him both, or neither? It's true that he mentally scarred Casca, and that act in itself is horrific to say the least, but the act of sacrificing a few hundred men? Was that really evil? I mean, he created a world with peace, didn't he? So what necessarily makes the act of sacrificing that few people for an entire kingdom so bad? Well, the truth is the intent to sacrifice a hundred men pretty much in order to save the world isn't so bad. It's just... That wasn't Griffith's intention. He didn't care about earning the respect of everyone. He had one goal and one goal only. It's because of this selfish goal that Griffith can't be seen as a hero to the reader and why he's recognized as the antagonist. It's because of the path that he took to actually get here that he's seen as the villain and it's those exact acts that aren't seen by the people of Falconia which is why Griffith is seen as a god to them. It's like Griffith's human form is a giant mask that covers his identity as Femto which represents the preposterous things he did to get here. The hundreds, if not thousands of corpses he piled up, the men he willingly sacrificed, the fact that he did that thing is all masked beneath Griffith's persona. More on that persona later.
Those who live just for the sake of living are already dead. Griffith embodies this idea, the idea that a life without a dream is not a life. If that's the case, then did Guts only ever start living when he began chasing Griffith? Is it even heroic for Gus to chase after Griffith in order to get revenge and defeat the evil man who took everything from him? Most would argue that it is, as many heroic tales are based on revenge. But in this context, chasing after Griffith is possibly the most villainous thing that Guts can do. Griffith is pretty much the savior of the world, and if Guts chases after the savior of the world, or in that case, the hero, then Guts would be viewed as the villain. So how come normally Guts would be viewed as a hero for going after Griffith, but in this case, it's the complete opposite? Well, the simple answer is perspective. Through the eyes of the side characters in the story, their hero is Griffith, just for the simple fact that they have no idea what the man had to do to get there. For us, on the other hand, our hero is Guts, not only because he overcomes loss after loss and tribulation after tribulation, but also because of the fact that he's our protagonist. And while Guts is technically an anti-hero, his focus shifts throughout the story, and he goes from being this villainous protagonist edgelord to almost having nothing to do with Griffith or revenging Griffith at all. Obviously, he still has some intent to take him down, but towards the end of the Fantasia arc, it's as if their dynamic exists for the sole reason of existing, as it seems like they'd never have conflict again. That is until chapter 364. If you really think about it, it's almost as if the roles of these two characters can switch entirely. Griffith could literally be viewed as the protagonist and Guts the antagonist. Kenzaro Miura highlighted in one of his interviews that once Griffith got reincarnated, Berserk became a story that followed two roots. The path that Griffith went down is the path where he is the hero, and the path that Guts went down is the path that we see. So to us, Guts is the hero. But he isn't a hero because he saved anyone or because he saved the world. If that's what made a hero, then Guts may as well have been the villain of the story. The reason we see Guts as the hero is that he overcame his own villain and saved himself as well as Casca. It was never about Guts versus Griffith. It was about Guts versus himself and Griffith versus himself. In a sense, both characters were heroes and both were also villains. There's a rather intriguing psychological aspect that comes with creating Guts and Griffith, and let me tell you, Miura definitely read his Jungian psychology cause goddamn this shit is so deep. Pause. Carl Jung, a world-renowned psychologist from the 20th century, believed in a process known as individuation. Individuation was the process of taking your unconscious beliefs, thoughts, and emotions and making them conscious. The conscious and the unconscious are like icebergs. The tip of the iceberg is your consciousness, the part of yourself that you know, the emotions you feel daily, and the personality that you have. Pretty much is you as you are now. Hence, it's the tip of the iceberg, which is the part of the iceberg that you can see. The unconscious, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. It's the part of the iceberg that's submerged underwater, or the part that you cannot see. It's also much larger than your conscious, which is why Jung believed that bringing those unconscious feelings into the conscious through the journey known as individuation was a process that everyone should undergo if they wanted to live their life to the fullest. <gasps> Jesus! Christ. Guts undergoes this process of individuation as we see in the Golden Age arc, and it's for that reason that Griffith becomes what he became. Guts was always someone who paid attention to his unconscious feelings. Whenever he was faced with something, we'd get some sort of dialogue that he'd have with himself, like when he leaves the Hawks and wonders if it was the right choice, just as an example. Because of the terrifying and morbid experiences Guts has faced, he's become closer and closer to his unconscious self, which is why he sets out on this journey to find his meaning in life and to complete his journey of individuation. Again, Guts is the hero because he fights himself and his life is the journey of becoming his best self as well as overcoming the immense amount of struggle that's bestowed upon him by the great current of causality. Guts doesn't hide emotions to himself. In the wounds chapter, you can see this very clearly. He breaks down in front of Casca and lets out his emotions. He isn't someone who runs from his unconscious. That's what allows him to push forward and that's why he has the beast of darkness and that beast represents a part of himself that he otherwise wouldn't have seen had it not been for the fact that he's open to his unconscious. Griffith was always a character who try and escape confronting his unconscious thoughts. Miura stated, in an interview, quote, I depict Griffith as a character who hardly ever talks about his mental state, but gathering characters around him who express their feelings has the converse effect of elevating Griffith himself, end quote. Even though he was known as a savior to Midland, even though he was considered a god amongst the Hawks, 
Griffith was only acting through what Jung called the persona. As he stated, the persona was kind of like a mask, designed on one hand to make the definite impression upon others, and on the other hand to conceal the true nature of the individual. This is scarily descriptive of Griffith. He wears a mask that conceals his true identity, and to be honest, this is physically shown within the story, especially when he becomes femto. And even earlier than that, it's when he's captured and tortured under the king's orders. Griffith isn't really this beyond human creature many people portray him to be. This is obvious through the number of times he willingly inflicts pain upon himself. In other words, Griffith hides behind this persona of being the Hawk of Light and constantly runs from his emotions, trying his very best not to pay attention to them. Because he pays no attention to these thoughts, they continue to build up without him even knowing, and before he realizes it, it's too late. Let's take a look at chapter 17 or Tosca part 3, because this chapter shows exactly what I'm talking about better than I can put into words. After Griffith ends up <clears throat> sleeping with this old man, holy f why would you do that? He can be seen bathing in this river trying to get the thought of what he just did out of his mind I'd imagine. He's also scarred by the idea that he continues to let people die for his sake like the kid shown in this chapter. This same kid shows up in the eclipse flashback which shows just how meaningful he really was to Griffith. Griffith has always been calm and collected but as I mentioned that was just a persona. As soon as he even lets a sliver of his unconscious emotions slip through, he begins to willingly abuse himself. This scene is brutally realistic as Griffith continues to dig into his skin, just scraping the literal guts out of his body. <laughs> Got he. It's at this moment where he can control the persona he's been trying to hide for the sake of being seen as something like a god. That persona wasn't Griffith and this proves it. After trying to mask his emotions through physical pain, Griffith brushes it off as if nothing ever happened and tells Casca that he's fine. With a dream like getting his own kingdom, Griffith must endure a massive burden and he naively ignored this fact, which is what led to his downfall. So I've established that Griffith has a persona, a mask that he uses to cover up his true feelings and to act a certain way, all in the hopes of achieving his dream. But there's another side to this persona, what Jung called the shadow. The shadow is defined by Jung as the unknown dark side of the personality. He quoted, The shadow is a living part of the personality and therefore wants to live with it in some form. It cannot be argued out of existence or rationalized into harmlessness. This problem is exceedingly difficult because it not only challenges the whole man, but reminds himself at the same time of his helplessness and ineffectuality." End quote. I'm gonna emphasize that last bit for a second. The shadow not only challenges the man, but reminds him of how helpless and ineffective he really is. If you're even somewhat into berserk, which you are, <laughs> Right? Then you know how well this line fits with Griffith. The most prevalent example of Griffith's shadow is when he loses to Guts. His ability to suppress emotions up until that point was pretty damn good, but this moment defined who Griffith really was. Many people, including myself, tend to think that it was the outcome of this battle that changed Griffith, but in reality, it was this battle that brought about the inevitable. Griffith's shadow. After the loss, Griffith goes and barges into the princess's chambers, rapes her and leaves like nothing happened, and then gets absolutely crucified. But again, it's because of his shadow that he's driven to do these things because he feels inferior because he can't deal with himself and his abyss of unconsciousness griffith breaks his shadow takes over him and does so because he neglected it for so long it's not like he didn't understand the consequences of sleeping with royalty it's that he couldn't care less about what happened to him because of how his shadow makes him feel like he is nothing the collective unconscious wields a dark side as we learn during the eclipse in the famous lost chapter. It was because of that dark side of the human heart that God was born. As Mura depicts in God of the Abyss Part 2, God was created out of the dark collective unconscious of man's heart, which is why God is symbolized as a heart. The creation of God in their minds was a way to escape the harsh reality of the world they lived in, a reason for all the evil that occurred. All humans have deep in their souls a common consciousness that transcends individuality. Their collective consciousness as a species, its dark side is this swelling ocean.
I was born from these swells as the ego of this world. This world itself is I. The darkness that dwells in every human heart. The idea of evil. This is God. As I read this chapter, I'm just left in shock at how brilliant this is written. I think this chapter deserves a video of its own. Specifically, the idea of fate and how it ties into the collective unconscious. Griffith's form as Femto is the perfect representation of his shadow, as it was his shadow that gave him that form in the first place. Guts' life journey is, as mentioned before, a journey of struggle and constant barriers. Time and time again, Guts is faced with the harsh reality of causality, a theme very commonly used in Berserk. A bit too commonly, because every f***ing time this guy is on the screen, you know the goddamn word causality is going to be spewed. What makes Guts Guts is the fact that he continuously struggles and fights forward. While it's easy to say Guts is the one who faced the most struggle, I think it's actually not the case, at least with everything before the eclipse. We never really get to see Griffith struggle, and I think Miura does this for a reason. It's because Griffith himself hides his emotions and feelings that we don't get to see them. And conversely, it's Guts whose emotions and feelings we get to see because he encounters them. This is a genius move by Miura because it encapsulates Guts and Griffith's relationship. The story is being told from two different perspectives. The perspective of a man who, while being considered the savior, is faced with immense unconscious conflict, and another man who isn't considered anything more than an edgelord swordsman who refuses to give in to fate and faces all the challenges that await him, psychological, physical, or emotional challenges, Guts busts through them all with his giant lump of iron. I talked earlier about Guts' persona, but as the story progressed, specifically in the Conviction arc, Guts' shadow becomes extremely prevalent. Yup, the Beast of Darkness. This beast grew in Guts for one reason, his persona. As the persona in Guts grew, so did his shadow. He fell deeper and deeper into despair, becoming more and more like Griffith without even noticing. It was his shadow that drove him to defeat Griffith, and it was the shadow that drove him to develop the thick mask that was his persona. He became ruthless and unable to control who he was. He lost sight of himself. His shadow, his beast of darkness, drove him in one direction. The direction that would allow him to take down Griffith at the expense of his own humanity. The exact path that would make him like the man he so despised. This is what Godo explains to Guts in Cracks in the Blade, and it's what changes Guts initially. Truly brilliant storytelling right there. Jung depicted in a famous quote that the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. This exact quote is used by Miura and used in a perfect way. It's in chapter 303 or the chapter known as Backlighting where we see this being presented. The chapter is mostly a backstory of the villain at the time, Ganishka, but it's also a huge moment for Griffith. As Ganishka is about to breathe his last breath, Femto appears before him, muttering the words that Jung once quoted. He who bears light exists in the deepest shadow, and it's within darkness that true light is discovered. Griffith, who bears this massive bright light demonstrated by his persona, also exists in the deepest shadow, his own. The larger one's persona becomes, the more dangerous and malicious his shadow becomes along with it. This was the case with Guts early on in the Conviction arc, as his persona of being an edgelord who didn't care for others grew very large, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. What did this do? Allow the Beast of Darkness to grow. When Guts rose to greatness, Griffith fell into darkness. When Griffith rose to greatness, Guts fell into darkness. And again, when Guts rose to greatness towards the end of the story, what I saw was Griffith falling back into darkness. That's all the more evident with the final panel of chapter 364. Both of these characters continue to rise and fall, to do good and bad, but a significant thing separates them. Guts was never blessed with a good life. He had to struggle to get where he is at the end, and that's what makes him a hero. He didn't achieve anything that stood out to the public. He instead fought against causality over and over again. Griffith, on the other hand, betrayed his humanity after encountering great difficulty. It's this that separates the two heroes. Guts struggles in silence to defeat his fate, and Griffith strives in glory to achieve his goal. Those are the two sides of the heroes known as Guts and Griffith.
Without question, this is one of my proudest and most enjoyable videos to make. It truly took a very long time, but I really had fun making it the entire time. And I hope you had just as much fun watching the video. Look forward to more of these videos. Comment what characters you want me to talk about next. But with that, I'm out. Jesus Christ, that took so long.